So if I told you a month ago that the Pakistan versus England series and the New Zealand India New Zealand test series that in one of the test matches the away side would win the first two test matches quite comfortably and in the other one the home side would win 2-1 lose the first test and come back and on spinning tracks win 2-1 I'm not sure which one you would have picked, Moin, huh? <laughs> or I'm 100% you know, sure which one you would have you picked. You say that. I actually the other thing to add, that. The other thing to add, sorry, also, is in the, the winning uh, 2-1, um, or well, in, in the winning test series, the team would do it without their star batter, or star batter, as New Zealand did without Kane Williamson. But anyways, um, India, New Zealand, we'll discuss in a separate episode. But Moin, back, back to the initial question. <laughs> You what know, odds very, would you have had on this? So if you had said very simply without any further details, in one, the away side would would be 2-0 up and in the other, the away side would lose, I would easily have picked it the other way around to what's happened. But if you then gave me the extra information that, I, that um, the home side would do a come-from-behind victory on and change its strategy to be spinner-friendly, then I would have pretty much guessed it right because India would have prepared spinning tracks from day one. We know that. There's no reason they would ever prepare a road. So I would just think of, you know, and probably India, <laughs> um, you know, just had a few bad games. And and also when you say without the star batter, that gives it away. Because <laughs> in Pakistan, <laughs> there is only one, you know, star batter. And India, you know, you can look at that team and, you can at least have two to three, right? That would fall in that category. But in any case, I think the point is, uh, you know, to not labor it, is that nobody could have expected such a massive turnaround of fortunes across the subcontinent, right? I mean, this is headline worthy. You know, we keep saying, and we you know, oh, this whole mantra that Pakistan know how to come back better than anybody else. But I think you and I both, and along with nearly every single diehard Pakistani supporter, would have felt that this team did not inspire the same confidence as the teams of old in their ability to bounce back, right? Previously, we, you know, even though I, I was looking at past uh, team sheets, I remember 2018, Pakistan didn't have such a strong test team, but still you had that belief that they could bounce back because that was in the Pakistan DNA. We felt somewhere along the last six or seven test matches that DNA was was nowhere to be found. We lost that 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 ability to bounce back. So I was actually, you know, you saw in my last episode, I thought the one all victory would not turn around and end up resulting in a series victory for us. I I think we both expected it to be three nil. You know, and it's not to say that we didn't think this team was capable. I just think we've we lost a bit of hope. Right, and yeah. that's what makes this turnaround even more uh, captivating and fascinating. And I can't wait to like, you know, get into the nitty gritties. Forget the score lines. Yes, the eight hundred meets Multan and Rahul Pindi. Yes, I understand that. But I think there's a more deep rooted reason as to why we're more surprised than we've ever been. You know, and that is the fact that nobody expected the team in the current situation and the current back office you know, staff to have done it in the way that they have. Yeah, look, I think I it's absolutely phenomenal. From a Pakistan perspective, look, on, on the face of it, you know, beating Indian to win at home, it shouldn't be that big of a thing. Especially this England team, I don't think, especially in the bowling, they're not the strongest, right? Or at least the most experienced that, that we've seen historically. So that, that that's a big difference. But I think in the context of what Pakistan cricket has gone through recently, I know, you know people are saying, oh, is this was this an actual upset or is this just normal service resume for Pakistan? And the answer in my eyes is somewhere in the middle, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Just because of where Pakistan... It was, it's not like a big upset as if, you know, like Bangladesh beating Pakistan at home, that was a proper upset, right? Um, on the face of it, really. Uh, I mean, the, the other test match, yes, the New Zealand leading, leading India in India is, is an upset uh, of, of all sorts. But, but look, I think... It's it, it is in a way you know with with the conditions and we can come on to that and and you know we'll talk about all the positives but there is some negatives to come at least from from my side um, you know at the end of the day you know you, there are still a lot of questions uh, to be answered from from Pakistan's perspective 
But look, you need to enjoy this win. And, and you know, Noman Ali, Sajid Khan, phenomenal. I mean, they were in typical Pakistan fashion. I mean, so many examples you can cite from the past. You know, people who've been thrown into mid tournament, mid series, whether it's Fakhar Zaman in 2017, whether it's Abdul Razak in 2009. Abdul Razak in 2009. Yeah, of course. He brought him in Razak. from Pakistan. He was, yeah. You know, uh, mid series and, and, you know, pretty much single handed. They took 39 of the 40 wickets to fall over the two test matches. I mean, that is just insane, right? I don't think, I think Atherton said it as well. I don't think. Any, like, I, I struggle to come up with any other example of as much of an impact that a player or two in this case have had having been brought in mid-series um, for a team. In a test match, one day, T20, World Cup, non-World Cup, it has never been so pronounced. Yes, it has you know, been a catalyst, right? Razak coming in 2009 was a catalyst. I mean, look at Razak's figures. It's not like he completely turned the tournament on its head, but yeah, most more often than not, it is to fill a, a gap, and that gap doesn't make you the match winner. It just makes the team more well-rounded. It's a catalyst to inspire. It's a change, whatever. But in this case, it's literally two people walking in an international test series against a, a very strong side from a batting perspective. Yes, now we've come on to talk about baseball and spinning conditions. I get it, but. Still, this is international professional level cricket. And two people just come in, take 39 out of 40 wickets. They score the bulk of the runs in the lower order. And they literally single-handed, and I think we were saying this as well, Pakistan should just field two players on the team sheet. Everyone else can be just <laughs> like, you know how it is, cousins playing in your backyard and you just give everyone a chance. And all you need is like one or two players who walk in, the two elder cousins come in, and they're like, you know what, we're, we're, we're going to do everything. And you guys just do some fielding you know what I mean but but that's what it was right yeah. two people that's all Pakistan needed on this team sheet right for for all that's said about Pak cricket being a team game cricket is a team game this being a team effort I think this is anything but I mean this is as much an individual's um series as anything you've got Akib Javed in the back one man you've got you know, these two spinners, you've got to an extent Kamran Golam in the second, Saud Shaquille in the third. I mean, they're individual pockets of brilliance here, but it has never been so pronounced that people people who've been brought in have so directly had such a pronounced impact on the game. It's, it, it's really remarkable. But I'll just take a moment to just say, and we're talking about Sardin I think this is really, I think this is a lesson for all of us, ourselves included. Everybody was asking, where have they been? And now let's just look back as to where they had been, right? We we in Pakistan love searching for scapegoats, right? And in the Babar Azam era, Babar Azam couldn't be a scapegoat. He was too big to fail. Shaheen Afridi, Naseem Shah, all those players could be um, scapegoats because they had that celebrity status. They were flamboyant, you know, and, 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 and they just had that star quality and the backing of a, of superstars. So who did you blame for that Australia test series where you lost 1-0? You, you went after the spinners. You said, you know what, these spinners, really, you know, really average, even though it was shortly after we, thra uh, we thrashed Bangladesh and Sajid Khan got so many wickets in Bangladesh. Sri Lanka, we, in Sri Lanka. Was it Sri Lanka or Bangladesh when he got those eight wickets? He got eight wickets in Bangladesh, but that was like a year ago. But most recently, it was the Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka, right? The, oh, no, I'm talking about two thousand back in 2020. Yeah, yeah, when Babar Azam also got a couple of wickets. In. Yes, exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. So basically, he did really well in conditions. But on roads of wickets in that series, we decided to put blame on Numan and Sajid. You and I also a part of this this group, right? Because we're like, oh, you know, they're not world-class spinners. You just do well when the conditions support and blah, blah. But it was easy to do so. But when you actually think about why we lost that series, did Nathan Lyon and Swepson do much? No. It was because of the difference in quality between Stark and Cummins. I remember that one day, I think day three, the reverse swing that they found, that our fast bowlers couldn't yeah. find. So really, the difference is either in the batting or in more act mostly in fast bowling but we just didn't want to see that and fielding yes but we didn't want to see that now i'm talking about 2022 here and you roll fast forward you drop them 
out of the national consciousness because they're just not star players. And it's unfair because you don't expect them to do well. You you prepared roads of wickets for God's sake. You know, like literally it, it, it was so flat that I'm sure you and I could have scored a few runs. You know? I mean, and there you just form a, a thing that, okay, no man, at least career is over. And Sajid Khan was brought in for one match in Sydney. Okay, and we we blame and we say, oh, you know, he was terrible there and all that. And I, I actually looked at the stats. Now, he won't come up in many of your highlights reels because he didn't get wickets or whatever. But when you actually look at the way he bowled, he wasn't that bad, right? It's just, you know, for a Pakistan team with that bowling attack in Australia, it's not the easiest place in the world. I know everyone talks about the SCG being a slower wicket, but it's all relative to other Australian wickets. It's not that much of a spinner's paradise as other parts of the world. It's actually better for leg spin because the, in, in Australia, generally, even SCG, yeah. there is more bounce than there is any in, in other places. So all said and done, I just think it's been a real lesson for all of us that we have the power of player politics and just player celebrity status has unfortunately clouded our better judgment for so many years. And this is a real slap in the face because you've got two, I think, world-class spinners, right? Now, my question is longevity in Oman's case. But yes, they had favorable conditions, but you actually look at the way that they, you know, they altered their pace, their variation, the flight, the little guile and the street smartness, which arguably is more important than mystery, in the case of yeah <laughs> yeah and, and also the, the other point around you know fitness i think no had some fitness issues which is why he wasn't part of the squad in, in recent times mm -hmm. look yes it is important and we've we've been big advocates of fitness and, and all those things right but i think you need to have a minimum benchmark but up on top of that you need to have the skill that that goes with it right and no i mean not not just with the bowling you mentioned briefly as well with his batting as well he showed that he's got the the determination to to do stuff um, his Laresque batting, as he <laughs> calls it himself. Again, Noman, La, Noman Charles Ali. That's what I'm going to call him. Noman, you are Brian Charles Ali. They always, they always put emphasis on the Charles in the middle, right? So whenever he scored 100. So Noman Charles Ali. And I actually think the way he batted is a testament to his fitness. It's not easy in those conditions, right? And, you know, we're not used to batting and all. But what I really liked about what Sajid even said, that Noman Ali is one of the most experienced on the Pakistan circuit. And these are classic Kaide Azam trophy wickets where nobody really cares they play on the same used wicket so here you saw the importance and we've been saying this on these podcasts for so long the importance of first class cricket the importance of first class right here yeah. you had a first class team right now uh, you know you have Kamran Golam all these you know Sajid Khan Numan Ali brought from the wilderness and they just banked on their experience in first class cricket so Enough with T20 stars. Enough with all these, you know, Haris Rao, who hasn't played, I think he, he's only played, what, 10 first class games? I don't know how many. You act now, these are your stars, right? These are the real cricketers, the pure cricketers in the long form of the game. So I think it's been terrific. Going back to the match itself, especially the third test match, right? Pakistan, the win was very Pakistan esque, right? Because, well, I'm Pakistan esque, sorry. It was, it was more. England did what Pakistan usually do, right? You know, scoring what 250, 260 on the first innings, 90 runs ahead, seven wickets down for the opposition, and then you end up conceding a lead of what 75, 80. I know, <laughs> but I actually looked at the stats, Zahid. If you look at the stats of England's inability to uh, clean up tails and like yeah. you know just roll an opposition over once they're in a position of authority, is actually quite poor, right? I mean, they're not as bad yeah. as Pakistan across all formats. But if you just focus on test cricket and England just play more tests than Pakistan do, their record mm. is as bad, if not worse. Yeah. They just are unable to, you know, have that killer instinct and just clean up opposition uh, lower orders and tails. And mm. the reason for that, unfortunately now, is because you don't have a Stuart Broad or a Jimmy Anderson, all right? Mm. And they typically it's often been a fast bowler's job, you know, your fast mm. Yorkers or reverse swing, whatever, or a leggy, you know, yeah. typically leg spinner because of the, you know, the, the, the bamboozlement yeah. factor. 
<laughs> Jack Leach for a long time now. You know, and I actually like Jack Leach. I think he's, you know, what he does, he's a really good stock bowler. You know, he he has his one monodimensional style, but he does that very well. It's just a bit frustrating that he doesn't often think about using his variation more. You don't need a dusra. You don't need all these fancy tisras and all these. You just need a bit of change of flight, change of pace, slight variation in where you pitch the ball, you know. And I think he's now found lacking more often than he'd want. Because he, he, like, that was the difference. You just look at a Noman Ali clip and look at a Jack Leach clip. Noman Ali, in six balls, he had bowled at least three different kinds of balls. Whereas Jack Leach, you could just play the same over again. and You could have different footage again and again. And forget the batter. You think it's the same over. Because yeah. he doesn't really have that variation. Yes, he has a really good style and that's a good stock delivery when he wants to curtail runs and that was his job when Jimmy and Stuart Broad used to get the wickets at the other end. But in these conditions, he's your wicket taker. He is the man who is leading that attack. Shwe Bashir, Rehan, Ahmed are a lot younger, I think very talented, but experience needs to come in here. And I think that's the difference. Jack Leach versus Numan Ali. Numan Ali just took it. Yeah. Took I think it's, you know, you mentioned variations, but I think it's Subtle variation, right? It's, it's very, very similar right. lengths, very right. But the speed, you know, he tosses it up, loops right, one, right. or you know, the, the quicker one that goes through, similar with what Sajid does as well. The old school, you know, arm ball uh, that, that used to be so it's not like he's trying to ball a dusra or a carom ball or you know, yeah. pulling it short, and, <laughs> like and, other. And other Joe Root fell for it. You saw Joe yeah. Root fell for that. It was a very slight change where it was just a bit flatter, exactly. And it goes out. Was it root or yeah. broke? One of them, but yes. Yeah, so so that, that makes a big difference. Yes, of course, the conditions help the pitch help, but you know, England were bowling on the same pitch. And again, what the thing that really kind of, from a Pakistan point of view, was really good to see is that Pakistan actually lost the toss. Right, yeah. England, England batted first. Yeah. So the first, the second test match, you can say that, but in the, in the third test, England had the best of it. They got to bat on day one. Day two was meant to be well, the best year for batting, usually in in such conditions. But you know, England messed it up by did not 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 um, batting through. But they did get a chance to bat towards the end of day two, and then they lost three wickets. Yeah, and, and then to be fair, and to be fair, I, I think two six seven was a very good result, yeah, even where they were. Was. And because all you had to do was ensure that Pakistan bat again, right? So if they were bundled out for under one fifty, which they were at one point yeah. at risk of doing, or under one sixty, then you you worry, oh no, will Pakistan if Pakistan get a big score and then we'll end up batting and then they won't bat again. But as long as you get them to bat again for something meaningful, that's what counts. 267, you thought that that was a good score. And certainly it did until Sir Shaquille's rare guard innings. So I actually think they lost. I mean, if, if you told Ben Stokes that the pitch is going to turn from ball one, but you're going to get 267, he would have, I think, taken it. The issue, unfortunately, I'm going to say it, is the bowling, right? Um, yeah, okay, the batting, we're going to bat ball, Issues with playing Spain, I get it. But from the position that they were in with Pakistan 90 runs behind, you were saying it should have been it should have been at least a 50, 60 run lead that they should have had. Yeah. And had they got that, then what they had then right now what they had to chase, add 130 yeah. to it, right? Because Pakistan were once or yeah. were, were, were 70 ahead versus it would have been 60 behind. So that's 130 runs. I guarantee England would have taken it home. Yeah, 130, 140, I think, in, in these conditions, uh, especially Pakistan's typical jittery starts, that would have been uh, a tough chase. Uh, but it came through. I mean, just just minor, this is, going back to your point on England and their inability to finish off the lower. I think stats might be slightly skewed because the majority of the test matches are against in India and Australia, where Pat Cummins True. and Ashwin okay. and co. have always had a... You know, they're the well against England, yeah. so, so yeah. I think they might be slightly skewed by that. But I agree. I mean, it ha it's happened Salman Ali Aga and um, Noman in the previous Test match, and then Noman in South Chile, and then Noman and Sajid. Uh, sorry, and Sajid and South Chile in, in, in this Test match, which is all the difference that that really you know Pakistan needed to to go you know, to win. Um, so look, I mean, overall, a uh, fantastic performance. Slightly yes. on the oh, go ahead. Yeah, just one point. Uh, do you think it should have been a joint man of the series? I, I was going to say that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it should have been. I mean, literally, how can you separate the two? And they gave it to Sajid, who I think took one less wicket across the two. But <laughs> I, I think mean. it was the batting. Both both had really good cameos, but Sajid Khan's cameo in the second test match, that was instrumental, mm -hmm. right? I mean, Noman Ali didn't score too many there, but Sajid Khan really took it away. 
and then he started being the aggressor in both innings, second innings in Multan and this innings here in yeah. Rahul Pindi. So it was the impact, right? I think it should have been both, right? I think everybody agreed, but I think it was also a question annoyingly. I have to say this, but sometimes when you're not prepared to have two man of the series, and like I think it's just easier to have one, right? They have one trophy sitting there, right? It avoided being awkward. Yeah. They said there was a difference. I think Sajid Khan got it more because his personality is one of those where he makes headlines. Good. Yeah, it could right. be. But anyways, but, but that's that. Yeah. Also, I think it could well, partly it could also be because it was Sajid who in, initiated the collapse, right? He was the one in the Very second test point. match. Very from 220 for two to 225 or six or whatever it was. I think he was the one who really made that difference and, and then so no one came into it. But so I like true. the fact that they give they, they give the man of the match or the player of the match to South Shaquille just to avoid all that controversy for this for the second for the third test match. I mean, but, I mean that <laughs> innings, that innings was terrific for all the hate know, that you've given him. For all the hate, all the hate that I've him. given him, yeah, absolutely. I, I I'm sitting here right now eating humble pie, and I'm so glad I am. So and, and, and look, the reason why I was giving him hate was South Shaquille was billed as one of our best players of spin. He was brought in. He's at a number five, which is when your best player of spin should play, and he had not been succeeding at the highest level on a consistent basis. You felt he didn't have that fire in the belly. He would give up like he did in Australia. I mean, with dismissals outside of Storm flashing, it was as if he wanted to get out. Yeah. And also, I remember that that World Cup ODI game against India where you're like, okay, Sochkin versus Kuldeep Yadav, that's a good matchup because he's a left, left-handed left batter, so he negates the Chinaman-ish uh, esque and also the fact that he is your best player of spin. But he was all yeah. at sea. And you felt my my reading is, I think nerves have historically got to South Shaquille. The nerves of the occasion got to him when he played against India. It got to him when he played against Australia in Australia. But I think now, you know, he had to put his hand up and said, this is my time. I am really good for a crisis. I've shown it in Sri Lanka. I've shown it um, in other places. I've shown it all across first class. And I'm really good against spin. This is my time. And he took it. And the greatest thing about him is he didn't get, oh, he didn't give up after 70, 80 runs. So yeah. I've done my bit. I've secured my selection for the la- for the next two years based on this. Yeah. I've done, I've done. No, he had a job. Even after he scored his 100, he kept on going. Then 134, the way he got out was a bit annoying because then I think yeah. it just takes the gloss off very slightly. But it is still a phenomenal innings. I mean, and the way that he just guided the tail Right, you need a number five who can do that. Right, we talk about Salman Aga's ability, but I think Sol Shakir was terrific. Right, he understood that. Okay, now this is time for Sajid to now get the attack in because his is the more prized wicket, his as in his own. Even if that meant that Sajid Khan gets all the headlines, Sol Shakir showed himself to be a real team player with exceptional technique. Now, my my request to him, as it is, everyone is. <laughs> I hope this is the start of many more such in instances because he definitely mm-hmm. has the ability. The way he yeah. played spin, w- and forget the quality of play. I mean, I think Rehan and Sir Shwebushi are very good, highly skilled. Jack Leach, very experienced, and you've got a very helpful spinning wicket. He swept the ball really well, which is something that suddenly our players have forgotten to do. Um, we used to be really good sweepers, but never mind. And I just think that the way he just red line and length, length in particular, was terrific. So I think that is a first-class innings. And I'd probably say that's probably the best innings of the series from a Pakistan perspective, no question. Yeah, absolutely. And it was pretty much chanceless as well. It's not like he was had lots of drops or you know, things like that. Which... Exactly. I know Salman Ali Agar has, has played a couple of crucial knocks, but he has had a few chances as well along the way. But but anyways, look, I think it was so cheeky, phenomenal uh, innings. Probably the best... Even Harry Brook himself might admit that his 300 might be pit by this Battery, 134. Precious little. <laughs> yeah, look, um, I will say two things, right, before we go to England, because I think England has a lot to say yeah. about Stokes. But before that, I just want to say two things. Like, why does this matter? You have to put yourself in the shoes of a Pakistan team. Your home, when you play at home, that is your base. That is your security, right? It's like in football, defense gives you that security, the blank, you know, that you know, the, from that footing, as long as that footing is secure, then you can find ways of trying to adapt and win in overseas conditions. But the most important thing is knowing how to win at home. That is your base. 
the minute you don't have that base, life is very uncertain. Because then you don't know what template you start with, which then you need to adapt when you go away from yeah. home. Right? When you don't, so then you are almost like a nomad, right? Which is what Pakistan had been for so many years. Everyone keeps saying, oh, is that still the reason why Pakistan have forgotten how to win at home? And the answer is yes. Because they made UAE a makeshift home and that gave them a base and they said, okay, this is how we're going to win there. But winning in Pakistan, it, although it's the same strategy now, but <laughs> they had to really search and find different things. They've developed roads, they developed green tops, they developed all these other things. I still think that there's a question to be had of how Pakistan will play Sri Lanka, Bangladesh or India at home um, because you know, those spin attacks are as if not I mean, or better. And they're also, in India case, better players of spin. I know that series is just hypothetical in nature, but I'm just saying there is a question there. But imagine for all the last two years, you not knowing how to win at home has meant that you're traveling, searching for a template, and you're almost like a homeless person traveling the world. And Pakistan is no stranger to that feeling. But now I think is when that feeling stops it wasn't in 21 when oh, 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 2019 21 all that when cricket came home it's now where cricket not only has come home but you have found a template to win this is your base this is your defense this is your i mean think of a battlefield right that this is your home turf now you have a template to adapt i hope that that's the strategy they take and it's not Another case of management changes, everything goes out of the window because that's been happening for too long. Finally, we have something to start with. And I will tell you, once you have that, your away stats will also improve. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll come on to away stats and, and stuff as well. Uh, I, I agree. I think you know, there's, it's good to have some sort of stability. I hope that this continues. It's not just, uh, you know, Akib Javed said this in the press conference, uh, in some interview, and we made all these changes, which they kind of did. Uh, but also, it also makes me question some of the things, you know, the internal, like like the belief of some of the ex or the current management as well, more ex management. Azir Memu, who said, no, we, do, we you know, we, we're not creating spinning pitch, which pitches because we don't have good spinners or something like that, right? He said that. <laughs> I think in, in, in all actuality, it was probably more our batters' fear or their inability to, to play spin themselves, which is why they were probably avoiding making such tracks. But you need to back your strengths, right? I mean, India have been doing it for years and years. And yes, most recently, they, they've, they've lost. But, you know, there's a reason why they've been unbe they were unbeaten at home for 10, 11 years. And that's how, you know, Australia have been doing it in Australia and have been doing it in England. I don't know what Pakistan had this fascination of having Australian style pitches in Pindi and stuff. But <laughs> Ramesh Raja got all this like Australian soil and making roads with where you ended up with neither Australian style pitches or spinning tracks and some some something yeah, you kind know, of nowhere. One, in no man's land. Though. Yeah, exactly. No man's land. And that's been the story. No pun, no pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, look, Shah, uh, the one thing I will say was they tried to prepare green tops. So it wasn't fear of batters, right? In fact, batters are also scared in Pakistan are scared of bouncy wickets, seeming tracks and all that. But I think they, I think it's more a case of being in that situation where you think fast bowlers in Pakistan are your reason for winning games, because that's been the case historically. Yeah, no, that's you know, true, and yeah. that's it's why. Quality right? of fast bowlers, yeah. Mood, or 90s, you know, it's all his fast ball. We got Shaheen and all. It's Azar Mahmood, despite being a professional coach, fell for what we all fell for, which is the whole player power and historical perception. And actually, in fairness, that's why I think Misbah really strangled out that old perception. When he was at the helm, he there was no flamboyance, so it was no individual brilliance that had ca characterized Pakistan for so long. It was boring cricket. And it was spinners winning you games. So enough with those fast bowlers. I remember we had that Imran Khan Jr. Just people who could just bowl fast and just get the ball old and then get Yasser Shah and Zulfikar Babar and before that Sayyid Ajmal in. So for me, yeah. I really give credit to Miss Bar for like taking that out. And I just feel that sometimes you you just divert to, you know, historical amnesia. You know, you're just trying to remember the olden days. Not near term, but old term. And that's what happened with as a memo, everyone, and if you look at Jason Gillespie's first uh, interview as coach, he kept talking about our fast bowlers and then he talked about Abrar. 
right? But that's only because he thought Sajid and Oman were history. And and he's got a fantastic battery of fast bowlers. But we don't. We have a battery yeah. of T20 bowlers. Let's be honest here. Yeah. And that's where yeah. Pakistan will really need to improve. And other lesser known stars, because they play test cricket, so they're more boring, need to be given a chance in other formats. I genuinely believe that. I think some yeah. of your best bowlers, who could be best bowlers in limited overs cricket, are not playing in limited overs cricket because they're not considered, you know, Sexy yeah. enough, you know what I mean? Uh, no, but <laughs> anyway. But the other point I just want to make very quickly is, and I want to get your view on it. Yeah. This whole thing with selection, right? Uh, Jason Gillespie and Sean Masood are out of the selection panel, all that, and now they're very open about it. Yeah, we're not selectors here anymore. So, what is your view here? What is the view about? who should be selectors should coaches and captains be in that selection committee what yeah. is that what what is the right I think, oh, there is no right answer which is why everyone does it differently but what is your view what is your preference look i think i think it's always very difficult to look at it in, in the context of pakistan cricket because everything is just so short term and and here why right so you can't really use that as the model i, I mean they literally put in uh, an umpire and a journalist as 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 you said and it worked right so in pakistan you just you, you just can't use that as as the logic but ideally i think you need to have separate selectors a, sele- a selection panel maybe of three or four people three maybe and and you should have and you need consultation of the coach and the captain i mean it's a bit tricky in pakistan because you have a separate white ball coach and a red ball coach so that's you know and pro- probably separate captains as well but I do think you need to have a separate selection panel not not more from a selection point of view but more they're probably more like scouts really where they actually are there on the ground and they need to kind of you know keep an eye on on not just like focus on first class cricket and see you know the talent coming in and really spend some time and that shouldn't be the coach's job right i mean your your international coach should not be there watching i don't know random first class matches because they need to focus on other things especially if it's an international coach they're not going to do that anyway so i think that you need to have separate selectors yes but i do agree that you need to have the coach and the captain's input along that and maybe the way england do it right is they have the coach and the captain sets the template of and and the style of play and then they have a selection committee who kind of finds those kind of which is how they end yeah. up getting jamie jamie smith right because ben folks was doing pretty well as a keeper but he just didn't fit that model as as a batter and and jamie smith does so that's why they brought him in so i, I think they need ben folks though they needed someone to just yeah. rough it out there you know you fed exactly that. Yeah, exactly, but but that, that that that's what I'm saying, right? That's why you've seen so much. Joe Root is the only one, but he's exceptionally good, so you can't do anything with him. But you know, there have been a few other kind of middle order batters um, that that have you know, I think Dan Lawrence and then there are two or three others who've ended up you know not not uh, not being part of the squad just because of the style of of play. Um, so I think that that does have something something to do with yeah. it. But I do feel you need to have. you know a some sort of separation of of selection and you know the actual kind of playing team but you need consultation of the coach and the captain yeah look um i agree with that i from my perspective right i definitely think having the coach as a consultant and advisor uh, or is is important because he is you need some representation from within the core of that team he knows what's happening in the team he he understands the players he knows who's feeling good who is it right so that and 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 as you say he and the captain should set the template so he should definitely be involved as a you know and and give and and be taken into consultation he should definitely be consulted more like an advisor right more as a yeah. i don't think he should have a vote and i'll explain why i don't think he should have a vote uh, but he should be as an advisor slash observer but someone who gives his opinion yeah. and it must be taken into account right and as you say you've got three four specialist selectors who do all the background work and all and definitely the chairman of selectors should never be the coach i'm looking at you miss paul hart but then again <laughs> but the reason why i don't think he should have a vote is actually a little more it's not just about his time it's because the coach should be someone that players feel comfortable going to to express their fears and weaknesses if your yeah. coach has the vote in that selection committee you're scared that by going to him and saying you know what i think i'm really having trouble outside of stump i'm all this you'll be you'll fear that that may 
impact on your selection because then your coach has that information. The coach must be the safety blanket of the players. So yes, he should be involved, but he should not have a vote. Yeah. Having said that, I genuinely believe the captain should. The captain should be one seat in that selection committee. Yes, he does not need to look and watch all those first class matches. That's not his job. You've got four other selectors to do that. His job and I think is that he is the one that leads the team in. So it should be his squad from which he picks his team. And yeah. it gives him that sense of accountability, right? As you say, setting the template and all. Often in Pakistan, if you give both of them advisory status, they'll just be ignored. So, and, yeah. and I think the captain is the man, you know, the coach is someone who conditions the players, gets them ready. They should feel comfortable talking to him about their fears and, you know, apprehensions and weaknesses. But the captain is the man who should have the vision, or woman, uh, should have the vision when they go out to the field. And he knows his players and he brings a different perspective. He may not know what happened in the 24th first class game. He shouldn't. He has other things to, to deal with, but he should know. Who out of his players does he back more than the others, right? And that is a different perspective that should give him a vote. So to summarize, I think the coach should be involved as a consultant. He should not have a vote himself. The captain should have a vote, right? Um, and and obviously the chief selector should be independent of these yeah. two people. That's yeah, I think, I think yeah, I think this is equally as important. Not not in terms of selection, and this is you know we're discussing selection of squads, the fifteen or the seventeen, so not yes, the eleven. Right. I think that right, yeah. that is that should be coach and captain, right? But and vice captain to accept. But you know, and vice. There's so much blame shifting that happens. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah that exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and but the other thing is, I think as important as it is for selection, this should be equally important for deselection of certain players, right? When they have not done well or they need to be dropped, where. I think maybe the captain and then the coach probably need to have slightly of a, a, a more say in that, you know, to understand. You know, and that's, you know, to be honest, like, like if you look at Shine not playing uh, and Barber, I think more both of those probably were Jason Gillespie's decisions as not much Barber. as they were. Uh, Barber, uh, maybe Jason. not Barber. Shine, yeah. yeah. Shine probably. And then, yeah, Barber was probably more the new selection committee and maybe Shan Masood if you're a cons conspiracy theorist or whatever. No, but anyway. So <laughs> what happened was Shan was quiet. And then eventually yeah. he agreed, which I think is his job that he stayed quiet. He listened to the outside. You know, sometimes you need a perspective from outside, a fresh perspective. So yeah. he listened. Jason Gillespie is one who opposed it. He opposed it. Okay. He opposed right. it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but but Shine and maybe I don't know him as well. But but anyways, um, I think it's, it's a good good segue into two quick things. I think England. We need to touch on them a little bit. Uh, I. And I say a little bit because I don't think there's not much, there's much more to say because they're not going to change their style of play. They did it in India. They lost. They won and they lost four uh, one. They've lost on spinning tracks. And I think they probably know that this is it. They're just going to keep playing this way. They'll win in England. They'll be competitive against Australia and then lose in Asia. I think and they won in Sri Lanka anyway. So against against Sri Lanka at home. Um, so yeah, I think for them it's it's not. I don't think they're. There's much more to say. Yes, they're, they're probably going to give these bowlers a bit more time and experience, you know, with with their experience. But, but yeah, the only thing I'd say from an England point of view, and maybe some of the Indian fans who are watching this as well, might have been cheering Pakistan on because Joe Root <laughs> has uh, fallen behind in his quest for uh, Sachin's record. So <laughs> that's yeah, the only I mean, other thing I'd say. So I would say actually my criticism is the captaincy, which is rare because I think Stokes is a phenomenal captain. I think Brendan McCullum is a great strategist and tactician, but I am going to say that there is criticism to be had there. The reason is I think this this concept of matchups gets exaggerated far too much. Right? It's very important in limited overs and very important in tests to an extent. But if it gets in the way of you ensuring that your best bowler who has the best chance of picking up wickets is not bowling, you have a problem. And I particularly drawing reference to when Rehan Ahmed was dropped after T. It was ridiculous. That is, it, you always have to think about what the opposition would want and not want. And the opposition definitely did not want Rehan Ahmed bowling. If you said, if you if Pakistan, you went into the dressing room team, like, guys, you've got two options. Would you rather have Rehan Ahmed bowling or not? They'd be like, not bowling. And you did exactly that. And enough of this, oh, because we wanted, it was a left, because uh, you had two left-handers and that's why, that's why you wanted your off-spinners, you know, your right-arm off-spinners uh, in Shreya Bashir in. But 
for God's sake, Rihan Ahmed has just picked up three wickets. He's easily the most penetrating. He's a leg mm. spinner, which adds that guile, bamboozlement factor, mystery, whatever you call it, more variation, variety, bounce. And, you've and his googly is really good. And, and his googly is really very good. good. It's amazing. Like, I, I think he's so talented. And on the other hand, you've got Numan, Charles, Ali. Forget Charles. Numan, <laughs> Ali, for God's sake. Okay? You don't need to treat him like a like a Brian Lara or whatever, right? You need to back your best bowler to clean up the low order and tail. Okay, and I'm actually giving him a lot of thing by calling him low order. He's tail. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's number nine. You know, so I just think that's where they just get a little ahead of themselves. Whether it's overconfidence and cockiness that you know we're gonna outsmart everyone, everyone's gonna question why we dropped the best bowler, but we're gonna show with matchups and be the right move. You know, the yeah. Well, the Midas touch, <laughs> Stokes is Midas touch, but I think yeah. it's getting a bit much. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. doing the basics right works. There's a reason, right? Don't reinvent the wheel. Simple, keep it simple. And I think sometimes they complicate things. I mean, I thought the way Ben Stokes got out, he clearly must have overcomplicated their living daylights out of that very <laughs> conventional off spin delivery. You know, I mean, so I just, that's where I'm starting to get a bit frustrated, right? Ben Stokes' career and South Asian condition, despite him being billed as one of England's best players of spin, mind you, is quite poor, right? Because he clearly mm-hmm. doesn't do it on turning tracks. He does it against spin in less helpful spinning conditions, but not here. So that's a question. He's not bowling. And I think that the fact that he's not contributing is probably having an impact on his captaincy. So he wants to go out of his way to do something ingenious all yeah. the time that would make headlines. And I just think it's Brendan McCullum and, uh, you know, we keep saying this, but nothing will change. But they just need to just remember that teams have been successful for so long through decades and centuries of history based on doing basics right. You yeah. are no different, <laughs> right? You are no different. Yeah. <laughs> you do not have the invincible bowling and batting lineups of, of, of yesteryear. And even those yesteryear teams did basics right better than you did. So yeah. it's I just agree. about coming back down to earth, I think. Yeah, no, I think completely agree. There's, there needs to be some sort of a semblance, but you know, England after the India series, we thought they might change their ways, but but they clearly don't. So, I guess that's how they want to go about it, and uh, that's and, how they, and, will and go they don't about play it. a game in sub in the subcontinent of February 2027 when they go to Bangladesh. So now they don't really care. They go to New Zealand and back. <laughs> but but I do think my point on thinking strategies is applicable all the world over. Yeah, right? I, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's 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 fair. Just just quickly to, to wrap up uh, on Pakistan and, and uh, maybe on a slightly more negative note, and as this is looking forward, right? Pakistan's next Test match is in Durban, right? Very different conditions from <laughs> Multan and Rahul Pindi, and you wouldn't expect them to go in with both Sajid and Oman, which again is is unfair, right? I mean, you can't drop a bowler who's, who's taken what ten and wickets or twelve, whatever you know, twenty wickets in the last two Test matches. It's going to be harsh, but I think, you know, what does Pakistan do going forward? I think I'm fast forwarding to the South Africa series. We'll do another one near the time where things are a bit clearer. But that is a real question mark, right? I mean, and there's, it's, it's one of those, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because if you go to go, go into Durban with two spinners, <laughs> you're going to struggle. And if you go into, um, or, or you drop, drop you know, one of, one of your batters and then you Play Amir Jamal at seven, and you play three. That, that, that's you know, and so, that's so, unfair to Salman Aga, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. So, so look. So the question really is, yeah, where does Park, where do we go from here? You know, I can and, tell you one thing. I don't think Zahid <laughs> Mahmood is part of the plans. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> He's not the plans on the yeah. turn on the rank turners in Pakistan. He ain't in the plans of South yeah. Africa. So, I love his contribution to the team. I really do. At number eleven, hardly yeah. bowling. I mean. Special, he's a specialist batter at number 11. We finally saw it. Now we've seen everything. Yeah. We really have. Um, look, I'll tell you. I, I My personal preference, I'll start with batting because it's a bit easier. The question is Barbara Azam, right? His record in South Africa last time was strong. He's probably better against pace. And I think, it, and look, you can't drop Kamran Kulam. You need to give him a fair go. Mm-hmm. My question is more about Abdullah Shafiq because I'm getting a bit tired. Because even when he does succeed and get a 40, 50, 60, I don't even call that a success, but that's how bad things have come to. It's often an energy sapping score. One that takes away all momentum. He never looks comfortable. I personally would back same as you because I think you need to be positive in conditions that aren't going to be that, you know, good to you. They're going to be quite hostile. And I think that fire with fire approach could help. 
But I would put Shan Masood to open. And if Babar Azam starts finding his form back, consider him coming at three. Because he's better right. against space than against spin. I've said this again and again and again. You will find that his record will do a lot better when he comes in at three. For me, I think it's the combination of him coming in when spinners are on at number four. And also the fact that two wickets are down before him puts added pressure on him. And some players, some even great players haven't done well with that. Why Ricky Ponting was always at number three, right? Despite there's a big drop in quality between Ponting and Damien Martin, but he stayed at three. So that for me is something I think they should consider. Because I do think Abdullah Shafiq's time is fast up. You could get Herrera in, but I think it's really unfair to give someone uh, a debut in the probably the most difficult conditions to bat in the world. So that's for me batting. Um, bowling, I think you'll need to drop one. The question is, you know, I know Sajid Khan has often been preferred as more of a wicket taker. But actually, I'm not sure. I think Numan Ali gives you more control. I think Numan Ali is more of a wicket-taking option at times because he's a left-arm spinner and he has those subtle variations. Sajid is also brilliant, let me tell you. It's, it's, it's really tough. You, It's a tough one to choose from, right? But I do think that Numan Ali gives you more consistency even when conditions aren't doing that well. And that's because of his his angle. So I yeah. perhaps personal preference goal maybe because I'm a lefty too I don't know <laughs> but when conditions are more spin friendly I think so the way I look at Sajid Khan has probably more upside potential but also more downside risk and Numan Ali thing and if so that's my thing so I'd probably go Numan Ali but one would have to be dropped that's the key answer uh, yeah. a key response from a bowling yeah. perspective I hope I hope Shahin Afridi does not make it in that series I think it's if ever there was a series where me Hamza needs to be the, the, the leader of the attack, it is right here, right now in South Africa. It's me and Hamza, it's it's Ahmed Jamal, obviously, and you need one other. And I think there you have well, two others, questions. right? No, because if you look at, yeah, Ali someone will come from yeah, so Nomai will be Sajid and uh, oh yeah, fine, fine, fine. Yeah. No, Meen Hamza is in for Sajid and is one more. Yeah. So that one more is going to be look, you can think of Khurum Shazad. My only worry with him is his pace has dropped quite a bit. Um, mm. So I would think about, when I think about the Australia series, where I thought our bowlers did pretty well. I think it has to be the same show. It has to be the same show. That for me is the it's answer. Because I think you do need one ratchet pace. And as I said before, I think the seam show, he was dropped, right decision. But he wasn't that as bad as the others were. He at least was trying things. I think the few drops that happened were of his bowling. Right. And like I, I think the Seam Shah has quality. I just think we expect too much from him. He's still learning the ropes. I think if you bring him in as somebody who's just raw pace on one end of me and Hamza, that's what I do personally. Yeah. No, I think that's probably the, the best way to go about it. And look, I think the, the other important thing is communication, right? I mean, I probably you still have Sajid and Numan both as part of the squad. No, for sure. Not, not, not the 11, but I think the, the important part is communication, right? Where you manage both of them and be like, you know, you still have a role to play in Pakistan cricket. It's not like we're dropping you and throwing you back into the doldrums. So I think that, that that's that, and that's where the leadership really has and to come And who would it. you pick? Noman or Sajid? I mean, it's, it's, it's a toss of a coin, but I would probably go with Sajid just because of that upside that you mentioned, because he's one, you know, who can, Noman is a bit more, you know, he'll give you, he can go for 30 overs, control. you know. He'll give you control, uh, yeah. Two and a half, three and over, yeah. Whereas Sajid, you know, if you want someone to, to turn around a session, you know, maybe on day four, you know, um, on day four or five, fourth innings, even in South Africa, maybe he could be the one. But look, it's it's 50-50, 50 50.1, 50 49.9. So it's, it's very close. And I wouldn't be disappointed if, if you know, one or the other does play as long as it, it's it's managed properly. Maybe you'll have both of them playing across the series, right? But but yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's I think you're right. It. I think they'd go Sajid's first man of the series in the storm and you can't drop him. I think he's given himself that yeah. extra armory. But uh, I, I've given you my thought because I also remember Sajid Khan, SCG, he was good, but he wasn't brilliant. So I think yeah. then by that logic, then Numan Ali deserves this slot. But anyways, but that's just you and me. From a batting perspective, I think both ha are very handy low down the order. Yeah. I don't, I, I know some people are saying that Sajid Khan actually has more aggressive uh, strokes than Numan Ali. I don't think that. I think Numan Ali can also <laughs> hit those shots. I think Numan Ali had a different role to play because he had come in at a time when Pakistan were quite a lot behind. 
right? Yeah. Sajid Khan came in when we were only two runs behind. So it was a completely different thing. I think if you roll, reverse the roles, I think Noman Ali has a really good sweep shot spread against the spinners. I think so both have an array of shots, defensive and aggressive technique. Um, yeah. So yeah, but that, uh, it might it might also depend on the combination South Africa play, how many lefties they might have because very they have good a left point. armor. Very, you know. very fair point. Yeah. So so I think they, you know with, with with Pakistan's left armors and the rough. What about you know, Babar Azam coming in and for Abdullah Shafiq? I, I'm I again Babar Azam. I'd have him in the squad, and I wouldn't start. I think. Look, as much as I don't like Abdullah Shafiq, but then you know Sean is going to open. I think Sean kind of doesn't want to open, or you have Herrera to open. Uh, it's I don't know. It's it's a tr- tricky one. I think I, I wouldn't do it. At least in the first test match, I would I would go with the same batting lineup, um, and then maybe if Abdullah Shafiq falls again, fails again, then uh, maybe he'll bring Babar in again. But but yeah, for now I'd, I'd keep it as is. Fair enough. Just my thoughts. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> but the world's most negative, you had a question, most negative. I think the most negative thing I I would say is how Ramiz Raja treated Shah Masood. I think that yeah. was despicable. I, I mean, yeah. you didn't let him answer questions about his win, but just, uh, uh, but, but for, whilst he was starting to answer questions about the relief that he felt after winning, he would focus more on how could you lose six on the trot? How does that even happen? And when will you get rid of this shot, this shot? Because Shan Masood often gets leaning edges. You know, um, yeah. he gets a leading edge from the, the front. Yeah, the way he got out in the second, in the first innings. Yeah, the, he always gets yeah. hung You know, the leading yeah. edge, it's a soft yeah. dismissal every time. But I mean, the way he just went on and on was, I think, really disrespectful for the captain of yeah. your team. Who, by the way, anyone who's criticized, I stand vindicated that there was a right decision <laughs> for Shah Masood to be captain. I think the way he yeah. led his troops <laughs> and the way he told his people, his team, people as if he's a leader, but uh, a statesman. No, he told his team, no, losing the toss should not be a demotivator, should be more motivation. It's something special because that's, I was like, yeah, that's amazing because it motivated them even more to win and end all the criticism about, you know, win toss, win game, which I was part, you know, I was skeptical as well. So I think, I think here's your answer. Sean Masood, I think, has been terrific. I think the way he's handled the press, I'm a fan of his captaincy, not his batting as much, but his captaincy. And I think he's well intentioned with the bat if he doesn't have the skills. So I, Think it's disrespectful. Ramiz Raja clearly has an agenda, and I think that's clouded his neutrality as a commentator. I'm sorry to say, uh, you know, because of him being one of the people who is blamed for some of the past, he feels he has to take this role, which I think is. Yeah. I mean, it's I, weird. You know, yeah. I, I used to be a big Ramiz Raja fan. Also, yeah. Though he was sensible, so disappointing. Yeah. But I, but I hope Shah Masood's <laughs> critics can stay a bit quiet. Yeah. It's a bit, it's a bit weird. He also, he also threw Babar Azam under the bus by saying Babar requested those flat pitches in Pindi and all that, you know, back in the day. Yeah. But uh, but it, it, it's it's strange. And, and the, the the funniest, the most embarrassing thing was uh, I'm not sure if you're watching then, but when England lost their last wicket in the in the second innings, he's like, oh, Pakistan have won the match. Blah, blah. Pakistan still had to chase 35 runs, right? And his comment yeah, yeah, like, I don't know. The match is funny. over. Pakistan have won. And you can <laughs> and tell him he had the mic when Chan Masood got that six. He wasn't even that. He's like, oh, and Chan Masood has hit a. Towering six and uh, Pakistan have won the game rather than the you know and here it is after you know he could have really made that yeah. moment as well but I felt there was a bit of bittersweetness in him which I think is a bit petty right yeah. I also criticize uh, like a bit of like the whole people holding your umbrellas I mean come on either you do it inside or you hold your own umbrella like Nasser Hussain did who's a far bigger <laughs> player than um, so here and then awesome, so. Anyways, in, in typical Pakistan fashion, we had to bring in the negatives into it. But maybe... There you go. <laughs> Look, um, thank you, Zahid. Obviously, this is a great victory to savor. I think it's been a phenomenal series, right? I think it's one that's shown a lot of various skill sets across both teams. And you'd say, in these conditions, the better team won. And that's what you want, ultimately. It's a pro sports series. Um, and... Look, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of cricket happening on the other side of the border with upsets all around. So, you know, we're going to unpick that in our next episode because we felt that it necessitated the need for a separate episode. So please stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you. Thank you.